Please, I beg you, just give some soup to my little sister at least. I'm so hungry. In the bone-chilling cold, two little girls clutching a 10-cent coin stood in front of my store. Due to urban development, my shop, which had almost no customers left, was airily empty of customers, especially in this cold. I was just about to close for the day when this happened. Upon seeing the little girls, Emily hastily brought them inside and said to me, Let's feed them a lot. Yeah, you're right. After all, no customers were coming anyway. We had surplus ingredients. We decided to treat them to a feast. At that time, I had no idea that these little ones would bring a ray of hope to my small, struggling restaurant. My name is Alex, 30 years old. Together with my wife, Emily, I run this small restaurant. When we first opened, we had a good number of customers, and their smiles filled our restaurant. But now, those bustling days are just a distant memory. The tide of time is always cruel. As urban development gradually advanced around us, our customers began to dwindle. Emily, let's finish for today. Okay, did we have some customers today? Well, somewhat, but still not like when we first opened. Now, our sales are nowhere near what they were at the beginning. We've been in a slump for quite some time. I'm confident in our food, so most people who do come tend to become regulars. But the fundamental problem is that not many people come in the first place. I sighed. Seeing this, Emily gently placed her hand on my shoulder. But there are customers who smile because of your cooking. That's the most encouraging thing for us, right? Yeah, you're right, as always, Emily. The exterior of our restaurant looks quaint, to put it nicely, but frankly, it's quite worn down, which particularly ditters the younger crowd. But even if we wanted to change the exterior, we'd need funds. With our almost non-existent revenue, affording renovation costs is out of the question. We tried distributing flyers and reaching out to people to improve foot traffic, but these efforts seem to have little to no effect. If this continues, we might have to close down. Did you say something? She didn't catch my murmured words and tilted her head in confusion. Seeing that, I gave her a smile and feeling a bit down, tried to shift my mood by talking to Emily. Emily, let's think of a new menu to attract more people. Yes, let's do our best. Though I knew coming up with a new menu wouldn't necessarily bring in more customers, it was all we could do in our current situation. Then one day, it was so cold that it felt like it might snow at any moment. Due to the cold, or perhaps because the place was usually deserted, we had almost no customers that day, either. Shall we close up for today? Let's have something warm to eat. Yeah, it's really cold today. Shivering, I saw Emily chuckle at my reaction. I'll start preparing to close. Wait, I'll help. Then, let's do it together. As Emily walked towards the entrance, I called out to her, and she turned around to wait for me. I jogged up to her side and opened the door. And then, we finally noticed the presence beyond the door. Wait. Oh. There stood two little girls, young and small. Their cheeks, battered by the icy wind, were so red it hurt just to look at them. Clutched in their numb hands was a single ten-cent coin. Are you okay? What happened? Startled by their appearance, Emily rapidly fired off questions. They, startled by Emily's voice, shuddered slightly but eventually spoke up. Please, just some soup for my sister at least. The slightly taller girl must be the older sister. She was holding her younger one's hand while extending a 10 cent coin towards us with her other hand. I'm so hungry. The younger sister, trembling, repeated those words over and over. It was too heart-wrenching to watch and Emily was the first to act. It's cold out here, 
isn't it? Come inside. Emily spoke kindly to the girls and led them into the shop. As she passed by, she whispered to me, audible only to my ears. Let's feed them plenty. Yeah, you're right. After all, no customers were coming anyway. We had surplus ingredients. We decided to treat them to a feast. Little did I know at that time, these small girls would become a beacon of hope for our struggling little restaurant. We decided to treat the girls to steaks. As soon as they entered the shop, they quietly whispered steak, and that's why. Hearing those words, we exchanged glances and couldn't help but smile a little. We had been wondering what to treat them to, but it seems our worries were unnecessary. Here you go, steaks for you. Steak. Placing two steaks in front of them, their faces lit up with bright smiles. Having smiles in the shop was indeed a good thing. Initially, they seemed hesitant, as if wondering if it was all right to eat, but their smiles burst forth the moment they took a bite. Delicious. From then on, their hearty eating made it seem like just watching them would fill us up. We watched them eat with joy, smiling as they happily and deliciously devoured their food. But the fact that they had no parents around and were out in such cold weather, starving like this, it seemed there had to be a story behind it. However, I figured they might be wary if I asked them directly. Especially since they seemed a bit guarded around me when I placed the stakes in front of them. Judging the situation, I whispered to Emily. Emily, Emily. What is it? Could you ask the girls about their situation? I think they might be less guarded around you. She nodded in understanding to my request and slowly approached the girls. I didn't get closer but moved to a spot where I could still hear their conversation. Is the steak good? She gently approached and asked the girls, who flinched slightly but then nodded vigorously. I'm glad. Are you full now? Could you tell me your names if you don't mind? After exchanging glances, the girls took a moment before the slightly bigger one, presumably the older sister, spoke up. I'm Mia, and this is my sister, Tina. At first, Mia pointed to herself and then to her sister, and Emily smiled at them, taking a seat on a nearby chair. Thank you, those are lovely names. When Emily complimented their names, the two of them seemed to smile a bit more happily. So, Mia and Tina, why were you at the entrance of the store? Where are your parents? As she asked this, the two hesitated. It seemed there were difficult circumstances they found hard to talk about. However, they seemed to be trying to say something, stuttering them, and uh, if she waited patiently without rushing them, they might share their story. After a while, as if they had made up their minds, they began to speak haltingly. You see, our house, it burned down, and we ran away from it. Dad and Mom are working at night, so they are not here right now. I see. Do you know how to contact your parents, like where they work? I don't know. I don't know either. She gently potted their heads, saying I see, as they looked disheartened. Then. Feeling the urgency of the situation, I decided to call the police, thinking their parents must be worried. The police said they would try to contact the parents once they knew the situation. However, even after some time, there was no contact with the parents. When the police arrived at the store, it seemed there was a complicated issue. In such cases, they would normally be taken into custody at a facility, but... Could it be that... They're all full. Yes, all the nearby facilities are full. As he expressed his frustration, me and Tina, sensing something unsettling, clung tightly to Emily and stared at us. For now, we can take them into our care. Um, Mia, Tina, would you come with me? As he approached, they clung even tighter to Emily. Mia, Tina, the officer is calling for you. Though she tried to gently persuade them to go with the police, they resisted. No. We don't want. 
the more they tried to separate them, the more their voices filled with tears and they started to cry. It's understandable. Their house had caught fire and they must have been terrified. In the freezing cold, with nowhere to go, and just when they thought they had found a safe place, they were faced with the prospect of being taken away again. It must have been too much for them. Considering this, I made a suggestion. Would it be possible for us to take care of them for the night? What? They've been through a lot of fear. It might be best not to move them around anymore. That makes sense. Would it be all right if we leave them with you for just one night? We'll give your address to the parents once we get in touch with them. Yes, that would be fine. Mia and Tina, not quite understanding the situation, still clung to Emily. But as the police left, they hesitantly moved away from her and came over to me, gently grabbing the edge of my clothes. What's going to happen to us? We don't want to be scared anymore. I gently hugged the two of them, who seemed a little frightened. You'll be staying here for the night. Here. A sleepover, is that okay? Yes, I've got permission from the officer who was here just now, so it's all right. As I explained this to them, their expressions of fear changed instantly, and they showed the biggest smiles I'd ever seen. Yay. Their voices of joy echoed loudly throughout the store. That night was quite a commotion. They were so excited after taking a bath and before bed, unable to contain their excitement. They involved the whole house in a loud game of hide and seek. Haha, <laughs> they are so adorable. Emily was with Mia and Tina the whole time, staying by their side for everything they did and holding their hands until they fell asleep. The two of them seemed to fall asleep soundly from exhaustion after playing, and we shared a laugh while looking at their peaceful sleeping faces. The next day, we received a call from the police informing us that they had made contact with the parents. It seemed the parents had shown up at the police station looking for their daughters. We immediately took them to the police station. Upon arrival, we saw people who appeared to be their parents, and the two girls happily ran to them. However, something seemed off. The father's face was somewhat gloomy. After looking at them, he turned to us and thanked us politely. Thank you for helping my daughters. Oh, not at all, but what will you do now? Given that their house had burned down, the parents must also be without a home. Considering they work night shifts, there was also a chance that they might end up in a similar situation again, I thought. Well, we have no home to return to, so we thought about going back to our hometown. But my parents there are quite elderly, suddenly expecting them to take care of children. We also considered renting a place nearby, but it's difficult to find a house immediately, especially with two children, and our bank buck was burned in the fire. Well, this must be what feeling utterly lost is like. Faced with a situation where every option seems blocked, anyone would look gloomy. It would be strange not to. As we pondered what to do, Emily, who had been listening, spoke up. Would you like us to take care of them for a while? Eh. He looked at Emily in surprise, not knowing what to make of her offer. No, but how could we? The unexpected offer had him looking bewildered. When he caught his wife's sigh, she too seemed confused. We can't just leave our children with strangers. I thought it was a natural reaction. At the same time, it was clear how much the parents truly cared for Mia and Tina, and I felt a strong desire to help them. But what to do? As I thought about it, I noticed Mia and Tina telling their mother about their experiences the day before. Mommy, these people let us eat delicious steak, a lot. We want to go play with them again. They seem to have really taken a liking to us, eagerly sharing everything about playing and eating with their mother. Mia, Tina, you two really love them, don't you? Yes. Seeing their beaming smiles, the mother seemed to make up her mind, nodding decisively and speaking to the father. 
Dear, maybe we should accept their offer. But they are so fond of them. They must be good people. Her words seemed to reassure the father, who looked at his daughters again. Seeing them nodding in agreement with their mother's words, the father seemed to relax, his tense demeanor softening as he let out a sigh. Then, he turned to us and said, Until we're ready, could we entrust our daughters to you? There was no reason for us to refuse. Jess, of course, we'll take good care of your daughters. And so, we ended up taking care of Mia and Tina. Although they seemed a bit sad to be away from their parents, they were visibly happy to be with us. But the happiest face of all wasn't Mia's or Tina's, it was Emily's. Watching her, I couldn't help but feel a bit guilty. That's because, truth be told, we had wanted children, but were not blessed with any. Though the doctor never told us to give up hope, this strain it put on us mentally led to our relationship deteriorating. As a result, we gave up on having children and decided to focus on nurturing our store instead. However, it seemed Emily couldn't completely let go of her longing for children. I wonder what you two like. I love steak. Haha, <laughs> you both said that together. You really do love steak, don't you? Whenever they wanted to play, Emily would join them, and if they wanted something to eat, she would make it for them. She showered them with all the love she could. Some time after they had gotten used to living with us, they came up to me and said, We want to help out at the store. I was pleased by their offer, but since our store wasn't very busy, there wasn't much for them to do, which left me in a dilemma. Hmm, how about handing out flyers? Yeah. So, they went out to distribute flyers with Emily. Perhaps moved by the sight of little girls handing out flyers so earnestly, a few more people started to visit our store. From then on, they also began to help out with serving customers in the store. Hi. Although they were only greeting the customers, their fearless and outgoing nature made them quite popular among the customers and they became the store's little mascots. Gradually, the number of customers increased, and the store began to buzz with laughter and smiles. This was a joyous development, and I ruffled Mia and Tina's hair, saying, You two have a talent for making people smile. Eh hey hey. I was incredibly grateful for their help, which had started to turn the store's fortunes around. Wondering if there was something I could do for them in return, I asked if there was anything they wanted. Um, we won picture books. It turned out they were interested in a girl's picture book about two adorable girls becoming pop stars. It was a bit embarrassing to buy such a book at the bookstore, but I managed to get it and handed it over to them, and they were thrilled. Thank you. We've been so curious about this, we're so happy. I'm glad you're happy. The girls on this book cover look a lot like you too. Really? Yeah, really. You too have a knack for engaging with people and making them smile, so maybe being pop stars could be your calling. Pop stars, huh? They looked at the cover of the picture book, then at each other, and seemed genuinely happy. I couldn't help but wonder what kind of adults they would grow into, and with each passing day, I found myself wanting to watch over them as they grew. But whether it was a sad or happy occasion, the time to say goodbye eventually came. Two months after we took in them, their parents came to pick them up. The father thanked me profusely. Thank you so much. We've finally gotten everything ready back home and can take Mia and Tina back. We can be a family again. Thank you, truly. Thank you. It was our pleasure. They have been a great help to us, really. We should be the ones thanking you. The mother also expressed her gratitude to me. Emily, perhaps sad about parting with them, hugged them and shed a few tears. Come visit us again, okay? Yeah, yeah, we'll come visit again. We'll write you letters. Mia and Tina, while hugging Emily, also started to cry. 
I was on the verge of tears myself, but held back until I saw Mia and Tina walking away hand in hand with their parents, waving goodbye until they were out of sight. After they were gone, I couldn't hold back any longer and ended up crying shamelessly, but let's keep that a secret. I hope we can meet again. Yeah, we'll surely meet again, I reassured. I mentioned that we made a promise. Then she, nodding in agreement, showed a small smile and said, yes. Then, 10 years passed. At first, we received letters from me and Tina, but gradually the replies ceased, and recently, it had been reduced to just Christmas cards. They must be busy with various things. After all, they are in the midst of their youth. Emily seemed to feel a bit lonely since their replies stopped and only Christmas cards remained, but she always seemed happy seeing the two looking healthy in the photos on the Christmas cards. No customers again today. However, the store wasn't doing well. Urban development progressed further, and our financial situation became even more challenging. We had been maintaining the store with the hope that Mia and Tina would visit again but there were things that just couldn't be fixed by willpower alone. If only urban development was the only problem. Recently, the situation worsened due to a particular individual. Today, the bell at the entrance rang again. But the person who entered was not a customer, but that particular individual. Hey there, quite empty again today, huh? How about selling this land already? Continuing the store is just accruing losses, right? That person was Robert, a debt collector. He came to collect debts time and time again, and although we refused each time, he spread baseless rumors about pests and rats in the store, causing reputational damage. One might think such rumors wouldn't be believed, but looking at our nearly empty store, the outcome was obvious. Perhaps it was time to give up. I felt sorry for Mia and Tina and Emily, who had worked hard together for so many years, but it might be time to close the store. That's when it happened. Emily came running from the back of the store. I thought she had been on the phone just a moment ago, and then she said in a hurry, Hey, I just got a call asking if they could film a TV segment in our store. What? They said they're bringing a popular celebrity along. This could be our chance. I thought so. Robert just sneered, thinking that a TV appearance now wouldn't make any difference, but this might be our chance to prove him wrong. Emily, let's accept the TV interview. It was a gamble of a lifetime. If this went well, we might be able to keep the store running. If not, the store would end as he wanted. But I wouldn't let that happen. Absolutely not. In preparation for the TV interview, we cleaned the store and practiced answering potential questions. Then, the day of the TV interview arrived. I could only sleep for a few hours the night before due to nervousness. Trying to calm my rapidly beating heart with deep breaths, the familiar sound of the bell signaled a visit. Wow, it hasn't changed at all. Oh, Tina, look, look at that. What Mia? Oh, the steak is still here. Yay. The names I heard were familiar ones that I used to hear and say often. As if guided by the voices, I looked in their direction, and there stood Mia and Tina, whom we had parted with on that day. They were no longer the little girls they once were but had grown into adults, dressed in dazzling outfits. Mia, Tina. As I called out their names in surprise, they responded with the same full smiles I remembered. We're back. What are you guys here? Didn't you hear about the TV interview that a celebrity was coming? I heard, but that celebrity is. It's us. To my surprise, they had grown up to become pop stars and were now a popular duo. Even Emily was taken aback, her mouth opening and closing in shock. When we heard about the TV segment, The Flavors That Supported Us, the popular duo, we immediately thought of your restaurant, they explained. We requested your restaurant specifically. 
All I could manage in response to their thanks was a stunned, ah, right. I only remember bits and pieces of the interview itself. It seems that the shock was enough to make me forget most of it, a phenomenon that's apparently quite real. What I do recall is that the two of them mentioned that our store and my words had inspired them to become idols. The reason we started as idols is largely because Alex told us we had a talent for making people smile, they said. Alex said that making people smile, being involved with people, maybe being an idol was our calling. He might have been joking then, but we always remembered it. We wanted to support people who are working hard, and that's why we became idols. Honestly, I couldn't hold back my tears hearing them say that during the interview. The fact that they remembered my casual words all this time and chose it as their path in life was incredibly moving. Alex, are you crying? Are you okay? What happened? I reassured the worried duo with a smile, wiping away my tears with one hand. It's just that I'm really happy, you know. Turning to Emily, who was also tearfully happy, she nodded vigorously in agreement, saying, yes, yes. From then on, we became busier than ever. Our restaurant started to see lines of customers every day, and the place was filled with laughter and smiles. Honey, we've got an order for two steaks. Got it. The impact of Mia and Tina was tremendous. They promoted our restaurant on their social media, and with the influence of the TV appearance, the place was bustling making one wonder what had happened to the dwindling customer base. Our continuous efforts in creating new menus and refining our flavors paid off, with customers praising our food and becoming regulars. Then, he showed up again. Hey, what's all this crowd about? And hasn't this place gotten nicer? During a slightly quieter time, Robert, who visited as usual, was taken aback by the look of the restaurant his eyes widening in surprise. This was because the restaurant was in the midst of being renovated from its old, worn-out appearance to a more modern look. While watching the astonished Robert, I signaled to the two who were in the back of the store. Mia and Tina were furious about what had happened to my restaurant. They were particularly upset with Robert and had asked to be present for this moment. When Mia and Tina appeared, he was even more shocked. You were the one being terrible to Alex in his restaurant. Spreading false rumors, that's really low. They spoke loudly, making sure others could hear. The surrounding customers started giving him cold looks. Feeling the hostile glares, he took a step back, fear evident on his face. I stood in front of Robert, with Mia and Tina lining up beside me. We won't hand over our store to anyone. Sorry, so, so, sorry. As we pressured him to leave, he scurried out of the restaurant. They, looking pleased, exchanged high fives, and the customers joined in the celebration. From that day on, our restaurant was no longer affected by Robert's defamation or the challenges of urban development. The restaurant was bustling every day, regardless of the time. We were busy, but we were living fulfilling days. Mia and Tina, though often touring for concerts, always made sure to visit when they were in town. Thanks to them, many celebrities started visiting our restaurant. Excuse me, can I place an order? Today, as usual, customers kept coming in, and orders were continuously being placed. Emily used to handle order taking but now her hands were too full to manage alone. Yes, I'll be right with you. I rushed to attend to the customer's calls. My face must have been filled with a cheerful smile. Initially, it was us who saved Mia and Tina. But before we knew it, it was Mia and Tina who ended up saving us. Fate truly is a mysterious thing, and I want to continue cherishing these seemingly minor connections. I vowed to protect this restaurant, which Mia and Tina saved from closure with all my heart. You don't belong here with that missing arm of yours, you defect. Get out now. 
The angry shout echoed throughout the store, causing me to instinctively shield my sister, Emily, next to me and look at the man in front of us. The man was looking down on Emily and me with an intimidating gaze. Um, I'm sorry, sorry. Tears began to stream down my frightened sister's face. The moment I saw those tears, something inside me snapped. I've reached my breaking point. Then you were fired as of today. With a cold stare at the men, I said those words. My name is Kyle. Right after graduating from high school, I started working at a company as an employee. Hey, Kyle, I'm home. Hey, Emily, how was your day? Emily, my sister, just started working this year. Come here, Emily, I'll help you take it off. It's okay, I can do it by myself. But it's hard to do alone, isn't it? Come here. Jeez, Kyle, you're too overprotective. Emily sighed slightly exasperated and rolled up the sleeve of her left arm. Emily's left arm is a prosthetic. Moreover, she has only recently started using it, so Emily is still not quite used to putting it on and taking it off. When Emily said she wanted to live alone after becoming a working adult, I couldn't allow it. Our parents are no longer with us. So naturally, I worry about Emily a lot. See, it's off now. Thanks, Kyle. Emily carefully cradled the removed prosthetic arm with her right arm. Hey, Kyle, today was my first payday. Is that so? It's already been a month since you started working at that factory. Congratulations. What are you going to buy with your first paycheck? Well, first this. Here, Kyle, take this. This is. Emily handed me an envelope filled with cash. It's to pay back what you fronted for the prosthetic. It might be little by little, but I'll make sure to pay it back. You don't have to worry about it. No way. This is something I definitely want to pay for with my own money. Well. Also, Kyle, let's go out to eat on our next day official. Remember that seafood restaurant we saw on TV. I'll treat you. Hey, that place is expensive. You don't need to do that. If you want to go, I'll treat you. Come on, that defeats the purpose. I want to give back for all the times you've taken care of me. Emily. I was incredibly happy that Emily cared so much about me, but it also made me feel a bit lonely. The next day, I talked about it with my co-worker, Alex. Emily wants to treat me to some pretty good seafood on her entry-level salary. What do you think, Alex? Well, that sounds nice. You should go. Alex said with a bright smile. I've known her since high school, and she gets along well with Emily too. Given her familiarity with me and my sister, I was hoping for some eye-opening advice, but her straightforward opinion took me by surprise. I must have looked quite downcast, as Alex cocked her head in confusion after seeing my face. What's wrong? Aren't you happy? No, it's not that. It's just that, actually. I've also received the money Emily saved to pay me back for the prosthetic arm. I'm worried that if she spends so much, she won't have much money left for herself. I don't think there's anything to worry about. Really? Yes, because that's what Emily wants to do, right? You should accept her feelings. Maybe you're right. Look, if you're going to keep worrying about it, I'll go out to dinner with Emily in your place. What? No way, that's definitely not happening. All right, then stop fussing and let Emily treat you, okay, Kyle. Alex teased, smirking and tapping me lightly on the head. Okay, I get it. While I still felt a bit uneasy, I understood what Alex was trying to say. I decided to accept Emily's feelings. And so, the day came for Emily and me to go to the seafood restaurant. Kyle, are you ready? Yeah, ready whenever you are. I turned around as I responded. There stood Emily, dressed a bit more fashionably than usual. Wow, Emily, you look nice. 
Really? I don't look too childish. Are you sure it's okay? It's fine. You look beautiful. I couldn't help but marvel at how grown up she had become. Then, shall we get going? I smiled, trying to mask the sudden surge of loneliness, and urged Emily on. We arrived at the restaurant and were seated at the counter in front of the open kitchen. We were quickly admitted thanks to Emily's reservation. Could we start with a few chef's choice appetizers, please? Of course. The chef nodded at Emily's order and with skillful hands, prepared the appetizers and placed it in front of us. It was the best stuff I had ever tasted. This is amazing. It's delicious, Kyle. Nah, it really is. Thanks, Emily, for bringing me to such a nice place. Hey, are you crying, Kyle? No, it's just something in my eye. I tried to hide the tears welling up from the emotional moment, turning my face away from Emily. I caught the eye of the smiling chef, feeling a bit embarrassed. By the way, how's work going? Are you managing okay? I'm doing fine. I'm a bit clumsy at times, but I'm getting used to it. No worries. Emily said this with a bright smile, but I knew something she didn't. Occasionally, Emily would come home with bruises here and there. I had once pressed her to tell me what was happening. I'm just not used to the environment and the tasks, so I end up bumping into things here and there. Emily said as if it were nothing. True to Emily's words, the frequency of her coming home injured had decreased lately, but I still couldn't help but worry. Emily, if anything tough happens at work, you need to tell me right away. Geez, I told you I'm fine. You really worry too much, Kyle. Sorry, was I being too persistent? No, it's because you're always there for me, Kyle, that I can keep trying my best. Thank you so much. Emily. Tears began to well up in my eyes again. I guess I tend to get overly concerned when it comes to Emily. Emily's current job is at a factory that I helped her get through a connection at my company. They mainly assemble pianos there, and they've assigned Emily some simple tasks she can manage with one arm. Before Emily started working at the factory, I insisted that having a prosthetic arm would be definitely better, but Emily refused to let me pay for it. Kyle, I want to work hard and pay for the prosthetic arm with my own money. Please, don't pay for it. Please. But Emily, it would be better to have the prosthetic sooner, don't you think, ideally, before you start working at the factory? I know, but... Emily closed her mouth, a complex expression on her face. By this time, Emily had become less dependent on me. It wasn't long ago that she would run to me crying over the smallest things. Kyle, I'm sorry, but I can't budge on this. I want to pay for the prosthetic with my own money. That's what I want to do. All right, if you insist that much, we'll do it your way. Really, is that okay? Jer, but in exchange, let's get the prosthetic made right now. Oh, what do you mean? I don't have that much saved up yet. Seeing Emily's confused and worried face, I gently placed my hand on her head. Yeah, so I'll cover the initial costs. Once you start getting your salary, you can pay me back little by little, as long as it's not too hard on you. Kyle. Tears started to roll down Emily's cheeks. Thank you, I'll definitely pay you back. It's okay if you don't, though. No, I must, I absolutely will. You have to take it when I do, it's a promise. Okay, I understand. I understand. I stroked Emily's head, comforting her as she began to cry. It hasn't been that long since that day, but lately, it feels like Emily is growing up at an incredible rate. As I gazed at Emily's face, she gave me a slightly troubled smile. What's wrong, Kyle? I was just thinking, you've really grown up. Of course, I am. I'm an adult now, you know. I even want to live on my own. That's out of the question. Besides, you can commute from home for now, 
so there's no need to rush into living alone, right? Maybe you're right. I guess I'll keep relying on you a bit longer then, she said with a laugh. Perhaps she realized how earnest I had become. Emily looked at me with a mischievous smile. Kyle, thank you for supporting me this far. I might lean on you a lot more in the future, but today is on me, Zoe Tub. Thank you, Emily. When Emily first started working, it wasn't just the injuries. She often looked exhausted when she came home. I had thought about convincing her to quit if this continued. But Emily has persevered and continued with her job. I felt a deep sense of emotion at Emily's growth. Today would surely be a memorable day for us siblings. As we enjoyed the delicious meal and had a great time, a man unexpectedly approached us from behind. Emily, what are you doing here? Uh, good evening, Mr. Jones. Seeing the face of the man who approached, Emily's expression darkened instantly. It was rare to see Emily, who's usually so friendly, show such an attitude towards someone, which made me scrutinize the man's face closely. So, who's this guy, your boyfriend? No, that's not it. This is my brother. Um. Mr. Jones glanced at me disdainfully. I didn't like his attitude, but considering he was someone from Emily's workplace, it seemed better not to stir up trouble. Are you from Emily's workplace? I'm her brother, Kyle. Nice to meet you. I'm Bill Jones, the factory manager. Mr. Jones seemed to be around my age. Despite being the manager, he was quite young. I remembered hearing that a veteran worker at Emily's factory had retired not long ago. Mr. Jones, Emily's always been grateful for your guidance, but let's leave work out of this since we're in a private setting and enjoy our time here today. Yeah, sure. I tried to casually stare the conversation away and distance us from him, but for some reason, Mr. Jones decided to sit down next to Emily. Feeling uneasy about it, I turned my attention back to Emily. Emily, would you like to order something new? Yeah, let's see, what should we get? Emily smiled awkwardly, leaning towards me as if she felt uncomfortable next to Mr. Jones. He was watching her intently with a somewhat oppressive gaze. Emily, could you look this way for a second? What? Oh, just as I thought, there's an eyelash on your cheek. Go to the restroom and take it off. Oh, sorry, and thank you. I'll be right back. Taking the opportunity while Emily was away, I moved to her seat. I somehow felt it wasn't right to leave Emily and this man side by side. You seem to get along well with your sister. I guess. It's normal, I think. Now I see. It's because you spoil her so much that she's always so coddled. His gaze felt unsettling, as if he was assessing me. At this point, I had a hunch. The reason Emily often looked unhappy when she came home from work must be because of this man. Kyle, sorry for the wait, and thanks. It's okay, no worries. Emily seemed to understand my actions upon returning from the restroom. Though a bit bewildered, she took the seat I had been in. Excuse me. Could we get a couple more chef's choice plates, please? Of course, just a moment. Chef's choice. Mr. Jones let out a low chuckle as Emily placed her order with the chef. Someone as useless as you, who can't even carry a load, sure is living the high life. It's a special occasion today. Oh, despite dropping important parts every day and getting yelled at. His words revealed something I couldn't ignore. It seemed Emily was being made to carry loads at the factory. Excuse me, sir. May I have a word? What is it? Looking at Mr. Jones, who regarded me as if I were an annoyance, I couldn't help but glare back. Mr. Jones, Emily isn't suited for heavy lifting tasks. I was under the impression that your factory was aware of this and hired her with that understanding. Weren't you aware of this? What are you talking about? We're paying her a salary, 
We can afford to give anyone special treatment, can we? After billeting me with those words, he deliberately leaned over to Emily, grinning slyly. It's disgusting, really. I have to tolerate your uselessness at work, and here you are, dining in a fancy place. Um, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. A defective product like you with only one arm doesn't belong here. Get out now. Hey, Mr. Jones, please don't raise your voice. Instinctively, I shielded Emily and moved away from Mr. Jones. Emily, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Emily tried to hold back, but her voice trembled and tears spilled from her eyes. Emily, don't apologize. There's no need for you to be sorry. I wrapped an arm around Emily's shoulder, offering her a handkerchief. She weakly accepted it and stifled a sob. Why should Emily have to endure such treatment? It was unjust. Emily didn't choose to be one-armed. Hearing her cry, my mind drifted back to the dreadful memory of the accident. It happened several years ago. That day, Emily was headed to a P&O competition with our parents. Kyle, can you come today? Sorry, I've got a practice match with a club. I see, then, it can be helped. Let's celebrate when I get back. You're bound to win something, Emily. Okay, I'll do my best. Thanks, Kyle. I'm off then. She waved with a smile, joining our parents in the car. Little did I know that tragedy would strike soon after. Dad, Mom, Emily. Suddenly called by the club advisor, I was faced with an unbearable truth. I rushed to the hospital I was directed to, screaming in front of the operating room. You must be Kyle, right? Yes, that's me. Doctor, how are my parents and my sister? I'm sorry. Unfortunately, your parents. It can't be. My mind went blank. It was a car accident. I was told they collided head on with a car that veered into their lane. Despite all medical efforts, my parents were gone. And Kyle, please brace yourself about your sister, Emily. The reality the doctor revealed floored me. After a long surgery, Emily was the only one who miraculously survived. Kyle, where? Emily, it's okay, I'm here. That's good. Hey, Kyle, my left hand, it doesn't move and doesn't hurt at all. What happened to my left hand? Emily, it's okay, don't worry. Just rest for now. I'll always be by your side. Soon, her breathing evened out in sleep. Gently, I touched Emily's left shoulder. Poor Emily. Oh, Emily. Seeing Emily, with her arm completely missing from the elbow down, I couldn't hold back my tears. Emily had aspired to be a pianist. Both our parents and I always supported Emily's dream. The realization that such aspirations had been dashed caused me great distress. Despite knowing that neither our parents would return nor Emily's arm would come back, the sense of loss was overwhelming. After graduating from high school, I chose to work. Kyle, are you sure you don't want to go to college? Yeah, it's fine. I didn't have a specific goal in mind. But Emily, you shouldn't give up on your dream of becoming a pianist. But, how can I? With a near tearful expression, Emily touched her shortened left arm. My left hand, it's gone. How can I become a pianist now? That's not true. Once your surgical wounds heal, we'll get you a prosthetic arm, and then you can start practicing again. I'm sure you'll be able to play the piano again. Really? Of course, Dad, Mom, and I will always be there to support you. Thank you, Kyle. I was determined not to let Emily give up on her dream of becoming a pianist. Somehow, continuing to strive for her goal felt like a way to maintain a connection with our departed parents. And so began our life together as siblings. Kyle, the pot's burning, burning. Oh, sorry, Emily, 
It's dangerous. Don't touch it. At first, we struggled with unfamiliar household chores. Enough, I've come to help. It's unfair to Emily to eat such food. Sorry, Alex. I appreciate the help. Seeing my never-improving culinary skills, Alex offered a helping hand out of concern. From now on, I'll take care of the laundry, so don't you dare touch it, Kyle. But that's too much. I'm not doing this for you. Emily asked me for help. Really, you should be more considerate even if you're siblings. Right, sorry. Regardless of our sibling bond, Emily was a girl of a certain age. There might be things she found hard to discuss with me. While Alex's help with chores was invaluable, what I truly appreciated was her willingness to listen to Emily's concerns. Through it all, we've supported each other and persevered together. Why should someone like Mr. Jones, who knew nothing about us, say such things to us? Seeing Emily cry under his intimidation, something inside me snapped. Mr. Jones. As I stood up, protecting Emily, I turned to face Mr. Jones. Yeah, what is it, big bro? Don't call me big bro. It makes me sick. Sorry, big bro. Mr. Jones's condescending laughter pushed me past my limit. Mr. Jones, you are fired as of today. What? What are you talking about? His eyes widened in shock at my words. Kyle. Emily looked up at me, worried. Emily, let's go. Wait a minute, what do you mean by that? As we attempted to leave, Mr. Jones called out to us in a panic. I couldn't be bothered to explain. I pulled out my wallet, fetched a business card, and tossed it at him. This is no way you are. I'll be reporting your behavior. Even if the higher-ups forgive you, I never will. Remember that. Ignoring Mr. Jones as he stuttered and gaped after seeing my business card, Emily and I settled our bill at the restaurant and left. We then visited Alex's house to discuss a certain matter. Welcome, I've been waiting. Emily, are you okay? Oh dear, you've cried so much. Poor thing. Alex, I. It's okay. Alex and Kyle will protect you. You don't have to worry about anything now. Alex welcomed us at the door and embraced the crying Emily. Kyle, I got the gist over the phone, but let's talk more once you've settled down. Sure. While holding Emily, I could see the fury in Alex's eyes. Soon after, Alex took Emily to the bedroom and put her to bed. Sitting in the living room and waiting for Alex, she came over and sat down on the sofa opposite me with a sigh. Did you manage to get anything out of Emily? Yes, but you might not want to hear it. She made me promise not to tell you, crying. I have a rough idea. Thanks, Alex. Hmm. Alex avoided eye contact with me, as if disgusted. It seemed likely. The bruises on Emily's body were probably not just from dropping things, but from other incidents too. That man, he can be forgiven. I understand. Let's go to the factory together tomorrow. Are you sure, Alex? Kyle, I feel the same way as you. Okay, thanks. Finally making eye contact, we nodded in understanding. Our resolve was unified. Tomorrow, we would confront that man. The next day, Emily, Alex, and I went to the piano factory. Kyle. I mean, Mr. Smith. From the back, Mr. Jones, having spotted us, rushed over. As Emily flinched, Alex and I shielded her and faced Mr. Jones. Thank you so much for coming. I had no idea you were an employee of Carter Music. I deeply apologize for my rudeness yesterday. What a turnaround from yesterday's attitude. Mr. Jones kept smiling and apologizing to me. I was speechless at a sudden change of heart. Well, it's not surprising. The company where Alex and I work is a major client of this factory. Moreover, 
it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say they are almost exclusively a prime contracting company. Mr. Jones, before apologizing to me, could you please apologize to Emily for yesterday and for everything before that? Uh, well, that is. With a look that said I knew everything, I stared him down. Sweating, Mr. Jones looked around nervously. Just so you know, there's no escaping this. What's with you? Oh, my apologies. I haven't introduced myself. You're Alex. Cut it be, you are. Mr. Jones was shocked as he and Kellex's business card. The current president of Carter Music is my father, and I work here as the prospective president. Is there a problem? No, of course not. I'm terribly sorry. So you see, you're missing the point. The person you really need to apologize to is... Alex, Kyle, it's okay. I'm fine now. From behind Alex and me, Emily let out a soft cry. Then, staring down Mr. Jones with all her might, she stepped in front of us. Mr. Jones, I am resigning from this factory as of today. Though my time here was short, I am grateful for the opportunity. Saying that, Emily apologized profoundly. What? What are you talking about all of a sudden? It's not like it matters if someone useless like you leaves. I couldn't care less. Don't come crying back to me. Well, we'll see who ends up regretting this. Remember what I said about reporting this matter to higher-ups. What? Meaning, I've already informed our CEO about this issue. Naturally, our dealings are official, the official documents will follow. You're finished. I've never seen my father so furious before. No, please. Hearing Alex's words, Mr. Jones collapsed to his knees, his face turning pale with despair. While he was visibly dejected, I whispered to him in a way Emily couldn't hear. Listen, I will never forgive you for laying a hand on Emily. Don't you dare show your face to Emily and me ever again. Yes, sir. Leaving a diminished Mr. Jones behind, we left the factory. Some time later, Emily officially resigned from the piano factory and joined the company where Alex and I work. Here, Emily, this will be your station. Well, such a magnificent piano. All the attachments to the prosthetic hand for playing music are in place. Emily, do you think you can manage? Of course. Thank you so much for preparing such a wonderful place for me, Alex and Kyle. I'll do my best. Knowing Emily's situation, Alex's father, the president of Carter Music, started a new business venture for her. That venture was the company's own piano school. It focused on lessons for people with disabilities like Emily's, and she was set to teach here. Emily had started playing the piano again, and through the lessons, she had quickly mastered playing with a prosthetic hand. Emily initially played and taught songs that could be played with the right hand only, but has now grown to the point of teaching advanced pieces that require both hands. After some time passed, it's finally time for Emily's pianist debut. Yay, I'll have some good news to share with dad and mom when I get home today. It's a dream come true for your family. Alex and I attended Emily's first concert as a professional pianist. Rumored as the miraculous prosthetic pianist, the public's response was immense, and today's concert tickets sold out immediately. Hey, why don't we go say hi in the dressing room first? Yeah, that's a good idea. I hope Emily isn't too nervous. Urged by Alex, we headed to Emily's dressing room. Knocking and entering, we were greeted by Emily's smiling face. Kyle, Alex, I'm so glad you came. Of course, congratulations on today, Emily. After the concert, why don't you, Kyle, and I go out for a celebratory meal? Oh, about that, Alex. There's a staff party after the concert today, so I'm sorry, but you and Kyle should go have dinner together. That's a shame. Tough luck, Alex. Laughing at Alex's disappointment, I couldn't help but find it funny. Kyle, come here for a second. What's up, Emily? 
While I was still chuckling, Emily grabbed my arm and pulled me to a corner of the room. She seemed to have something on her mind. I listened attentively. Kyle, you know this is the perfect opportunity, right? A uh, opportunity for what? Deez, Kyle, you and Alex are alone today. It's the perfect chance to confess. Hut, Emily, since when did you know about? From the very beginning. Kyle, you always put others first, didn't you? I'm fine now, okay. Emily said this with a cheerful smile. Don't worry, Kyle. I think you two definitely have mutual feelings for each other. Is that so? What are you two whispering about over there? It's nothing. I blurted out, suddenly too conscious to look Alex in the eye. What's wrong? Your face is all red. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I managed to respond. Emily watched our exchange with a beaming smile, clearly amused by the situation. On this day, as Emily's dream came true, it seemed my role as her steadfast supporter might have come to an end. As for what happens next between Alex and me, becoming much closer than ever before, well, that's a story for another time.